Hey everyone, Morrow again, coming at you with another episode of First Impressions, the video series where I dissect films, either ones that I just have watched that I've been meaning to watch for a while, or those still in that theatrical run. Today's one of the first ones, it's a film I've been meaning to watch for a couple years now. Only recently got around to watching it, it was on uh, Turner Classic Movies a couple weeks ago, I had it on the DVR, and yesterday, which is Sunday, I decided to sit down and watch it in the morning. The movie is only 87 minutes long, so it's not going to take up much of my time. And it's a film I had fun with, and the thing about the thing about it is, I have seen the remake of it, and the remake is not only one of my favorite remakes of all time, one of my favorite films from the 80s, and definitely one of my favorite films in general. And while I'll say this is a good film, I'll say I definitely like the remake better. But for its time period, this film is pretty good, and it still is a fun film to watch now. It's also interesting to watch these two films back to back, which, once I'm done recording this, I am going to sit down and watch the original, the remake, I should say. <clears throat> And of course is the thing from another world. Now before I get too far ahead of myself, yes, that is the birdie. That is little Rocky. Say hello, Rocky. Say hello. Oh, I guess he doesn't want to chatter. He just wants to see. Oh, now that you get hidden from the camera, you say something. See, he's in there, little bobbin. Bobbin's little head. Silly cockatiel. Now the film is directed by Christian Nibai. Or Nibi, however. I think it's Nibi. Nibi. N-Y-B-Y. You tell me how it's pronounced. Nye-B sounds like a new pronunciation. And it was produced by Howard Hawks. Now, a little interesting bit of trivia with this is that apparently there's a lot of uh, hoopla about who actually directed it. Some say that Nye-B directed it, while others say Hawks ghost directed the film and gave nye -B the credit so that he could get his Director's Guild card. And if this sounds familiar, we have a very similar situation, but with different circumstances on a classic 80s film, Poltergeist. See, people say Steven Spielberg directed the film, while others say that Toby Hooper did. Now, with this one, we actually have a statement from Nyby. He gave this statement in 1982, and I quote, Did Hawks direct it? That's one of the most insane and ridiculous questions I've ever heard, and people keep asking. That it was Hawk style? Of course it was. This is a man I studied and wanted to be like. You would certainly emulate and copy the master you're sitting under, which I did. Anyway, if you're taking painting lessons from Rembrandt, you don't take the brush out of the master's hand. Well, I think that kind of sums that up. He says he did the movie and that Hawks was the producer, but he took notes from Hawks. Which Hawks is the kind of guy you will take notes from. I mean, these are some of the films he directed throughout his career. Red River, the only John Wayne film I've seen. I know some people are going to go, what them's fighting words? I know some people are going to go, fill your hands, you son of a bitch. One, like I've said multiple times, westerns was never my favorite genre, so growing up, never really saw the need to watch any. Only saw Red River in a class and just a random thing. I do actually want to look up more of his films, but definitely a good western to start with from him. Sergeant York, which this film actually does reference in the dialogue. I saw Sergeant York. Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. Um, Monroe film I do need to watch. And of course, the original Scarface. And... Uh, if you're gonna emulate someone, emulate one of the best. And uh, that's actually one of the things I kind of learned in my film class. I mean, it's not something I really need to know, but it is one thing to mention in a lecture that one way to learn, at least from a technical standpoint, is to emulate shots. I mean, Lucas did that with Star Wars. I mean, he stole a shot from the searchers. And if uh, you have the guy who you're uh, emulating on set with you, it's going to be a little easier to do it stylistically, but then you're also going to get confusion like this. Now some people are probably going to say, well, he was at, asked directly, so of course he's going to say he directed it, so there's that thing too, and a lot of the actors on the set go back and forth when, between who did it, but there's also the thing that maybe just from what they saw, they only saw a little snippet and then they think that. So it's one of those things that's never going to die, just like the Poltergeist one, but I'll say I believe, mm, I believe Nibi a little bit. Now, the plot of The Thing of Another World is that we got this crew of Arctic soldiers, their Air Force personnel, they're stationed at this one base, and they are sent down to this other little station that's out in the middle of nowhere. While they're there, they find what appears to be a crashed spacecraft. They dig it up using thermite charges, destroying the ship in the process, but they find the body of a crewman. They get the ice out surrounding it, take it back to the station. They eventually decide to thaw it out, the creature runs amok, and they have to contain it. They get it contained to do a green room, and then it breaks out a couple times, attacks them, and, you know, they fight back, self-defense. They find out that this creature is plant-based, and it reproduces by feeding on blood, so there's a little bit of a vampire thing. 
Now one of the scientists finds this out by getting pieces of its DNA and starts to cultivate it, basically. Now, he is the one who's basically the only scientist that doesn't want to kill the thing. Everyone else wants to get rid of it, even if it goes against orders. This guy, he's like, think of what we can learn from it. So there's a little bit of that usual typical scientist that doesn't want to listen to reason, which actually comes up in the climax, which I'm not going to spoil it, because I actually think you guys should watch it. But it's a nice little back-and-forth dichotomy in this. Really nails home the time period the film was made in. It was made in 51. You know, the beginning of the Red Scare. You have some of that uh, skepticism and doubt from the end of World War II, the whole post-Hiroshima and Nagasaki thing. Where, you know, people are being a little skeptical about uh, the future, mainly with nuclear weapons. And, of course, like I said, the Red Scare, so you get that little bit of other thing. I mean, they mentioned the Russians a couple times, but nothing really, like, Big Red Scare-ish. But you can tell that that's a little bit in the background. So this is definitely one of those films that's of its time. You couldn't really have made this film later. I mean, later on in the Cold War, maybe, but it would have been a little bit more in your face about uh, the whole Red communist thing so it would have been a vastly different film so this film like i said came out right at the right time to get this uh, view of alien in there and of course it has that famous line at the very end watch the skies when talking about it if you know anything about how faithful carpenter's film is to the original short story you can tell that this one is a very very loose adaptation just basically taking the general story and twisting it a lot yeah, a lot like some of these early horror adaptations did. I mean, like how the classic Universal Frankenstein and Dracula films are, that they barely have any resemblance to their source material. But those ones are a lot more faithful to their original source material than this one is. But it's still a good film. I can definitely see watching it if you grew up in the 50s or even in the couple decades afterwards. Watching this as a kid, it would scare the crap out of you. And I can see how from a technical standpoint, it would inspire a lot of directors like John Carpenter. And I think even Ridley Scott, from what I looked up, was inspired by this film. Carpenter, I can definitely see the inspiration in his film style. And he paid good tribute to it in his. And Hawks and Nivey not liking his. And I could sort of see it because of the style and school they come from. But to say it was trash, basically, it's like, oh, that's, that is a big uh, uh, step in the wrong direction for them to say that. But you know, that's a whole other subject. And one other li little interesting note is that this is apparently one of the first films, if not the first film, to feature a stuntman being set on fire in a film. Because we got that famous scene where the thing comes into the room and they set it on fire with kerosene. Which watching that is like, ooh, that's excellent stunt work. And just looking how the flames go, it's like, how did they manage to film this at this time? I know they probably had a lot of people on set with fire extinguishers. But just watching it, it's like, ooh. I got, I'm watching it in two lenses as a fan, like, ooh, that's an excellent scene. But also the... Technical aspects, like, how they managed to do this in 51? It's like, damn, they must have planned this one rigorously before they put it in from the camera. And with how many different angles we got, it's like, did they film it all in just one take and edit it carefully? Or did they do multiple takes? It's one of those little things I want to find out about it. Now, there's a lot of actors in there because it's an ensemble cast. I'm only going to mention a couple of the actors here. We got Charles Lederer. And I'm guessing that's the pronunciation. It's L-E-D-E-R-E-R. -E -E Lederer, I'm guessing. Uh, before we get into the actors, uh, Charles Lederer did the screenplay. Apparently he also had help from Hawks and another guy from what I've read, but he's the main credited one. Other films he was involved with are His Girl Friday, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, Mutiny on the Bounty from 62, in the original Ocean's Eleven. He also did some directing, but they're not as, I don't recognize the titles as much as those ones, so I'm not going to mention them. Now the actors, we got Kenneth Toby, who played the captain character. He also had roles in Beasts from 20,000 Fathoms, uh, the two with Disney David Croc David Crockett, Crockett films, <sighs> stumbling over my words. Uh, he played different characters in both of them. I haven't watched them yet, so nothing else to notice. The original Walking Tall, and this is one I thought was interesting, because this is one I've actually seen him in. He played the projectionist in Gremlins 2, and that's one of his final roles. So, looking at it, he goes from The Thing from Another World to Gremlins 2. Kind of an interesting little career evolution. Uh, we, next is Robert Corn, Cornthwaite. I know that's a weird one though. You got to drag it out. Cornthwaite. Corn't, Cornthwaite. He played Doctor Carrington, who is the doctor's like, oh, we can't destroy the thing. He also had roles on War of the Worlds. Whatever happened to Baby Jane? 
and he does a good job. You I mean you kind of understand his viewpoint, even though you want to smack him upside the head. So what happens to him in the end? Kind of warranted. Then we got Dewey Martin as the crew chief character. Uh, I re looking at him, I'm looking at his face. I'm like, why does this guy look familiar? Google's like, oh, it is. It's the guy that played the dad from Seven Alone. No wonder I recognize him. This is 20 years earlier, but I could tell it's him. He still has that baby face in this movie, whereas in Seven Alone, he really looked his age. And also his voice had darkened a little bit by the time he did Seven Alone. The only other person of note to mention is the person who played the thing himself, James Arnis, a.k.a. Marshall Dillon from Gunsmoke. That's right, he was in here, so another little weird western connection with this film. He does okay for what he has to do. The role is basically nothing. He's basically just a glorified stuntman, for lack of a better term, because he's just there in the costume. And apparently he hated the costume he had to wear looking at it. I could sort of, sort of see why, but it's an effective costume for this film. For this sort of film in the time period it was made. And it doesn't have any dialogue. He just stands there and looks menacing, you know, like, Rah! a little bit. Even though you could say Boris Karloff had more to do as the monster in the original Frankenstein than he did in this one. But it's a good thing he went on to bigger and better things as Marshall Dillon. It was composed by Russian-born American Dmitry Tiominkin who also did ones for The Old Man in the Sea, and he received 22 Academy Award nominations and won four. One of them for being that one, High Noon, The High and the Mighty. And nothing really else much to say about this film. I mean, definitely a film that comes with my recommendation, more so if you're a fan of B-monster movies from the 50s, or if you're a fan of Carpenter's film and are interested to see exactly what inspired him from this film. Watching this film, you can definitely see where it influenced Carpenter, and you can definitely see where it influenced dozens of other filmmakers.